My beloved brothers and sisters and all the dear visitors and young people and we have children in our midst it is truly a great joy for me to be with you today as brother David announced that I am visiting here and I am very happy to be your visitor some time ago when I um, returned from a trip to my home church in Adelaide, in Australia, where I live. Um, a brother who was announcing, like David, he said, we are very happy to have a visitor in our midst today. <laughs> brother Jacek is visiting us today. So now we are, as it says, we are pilgrims and strangers, isn't it? We are truly visitors on this earth, my dear brothers and sisters. Where is our home, our permanent home? Where? Heaven. Heaven, that's right. Abraham understood that very well. For what, for what city did he look for? A heavenly one, that's right, that will never pass away. A city where there is eternal peace. You know, they call this earthly Jerusalem a holy city. I would rather call it a war city, isn't it? city full of distress and hatred and sorrow. <clears throat> but it is truly a great joy for all of us today. It is a special Sabbath, as it has been announced, and that we can be all together to worship the Lord. There's nothing better, my dear brothers and sisters, if we, than experiencing the joy of the Sabbath, isn't it? The more we understand the, the, the peace and tranquility and the joy of the Sabbath, the more we understand the love of God, isn't it? How in the very beginning, God knew what we need. He knew what human beings need from Adam right to his second coming. And as time goes on, things are not getting easier. And we need more and more this Sabbath, isn't it? This wonderful rest and peace. But of course, we have to first have peace with our Savior. We have to find peace in Jesus. Because Jesus did say that His peace He gives to us. And that is a peace and, 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 and tranquility, if you like, as no one or nothing on this earth can give. And we should praise the Lord above all people on earth whom Jesus has called and for the response by His grace <clears throat> that we have responded to His call. Now I wish to share with you something that uh, is very dear to my heart and I'm sure all of us uh, uh, have need of this uh, uh, joy or of experiencing the righteousness of Christ in their lives. Because we know that through Christ and by Christ we are saved by His righteousness, not by our righteousness. Uh, so I wish to speak about, I have given title to it, Our Passport to and Fitness for Heaven. Our passport to and fitness for heaven. Why I put this title? Because we read, in faith I live by, it says the righteousness by which we are justified is what? Imputed to us. Ascribed to us. Given to us. The righteousness by which we are sanctified is imparted. The first is what? Our title? To heaven. The first is our title to heaven. If we do not have title to heaven, we cannot enter heaven, brothers and sisters. The second is our fitness for heaven. I remember some, oh, quite a number of years ago, Brother Sass would remember this. When Brother Sass was a regional secretary for Asia Pacific region at that time was one region was a quite large region and I was assistant to Brother Sass that was a 
somewhat very, very new experience for me. And I felt very, uh, what shall I say, very deficient. We are, we are always deficient, of course. Our deficiency is in the Lord. But I just felt somehow, I don't know whether I should have been in it. Uh, we went to the Philippines together. And praise the Lord, we had a wonderful time together. But then uh, I remember Brother Sash calling me and telling me, Brother, prepare yourself to go with me to Indonesia. I remember this very well. Now, so I started preparing myself. I had uh, a passport. I got a pa I had a passport. I had a visa. And few days, and few days before our departure, what happened? I got sick. <laughs> but I got so very badly sick that I could not go. I, and I was so stressed about it. And, and I had to tell Brother Sass, no, I cannot go. I, I tried to rest and do all sorts of treatments in order to get fit to travel. But I was not fit to travel. So I learned a great spiritual lesson. You know, in the Word of God, there is a wonderful text uh, which embraces, we would say, the whole gospel, the beautiful gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is in John 3.16. What does it say? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Now this is what I would call God, our Heavenly Father, has made a valuable a passport for everyone in the world. This is availability of passport. Well, I'm emphasizing this. Because in some countries, not all the citizens receive passport. Or actually, as a matter of fact, only very few. And that was the case when I was young in Yugoslavia. I, I decided to leave the country as a young man. And I made every effort. I knocked on many doors. I appealed to many people to give me a passport. They said, no. And the answer was, no. You cannot have by law, you cannot have passport, because you have not done your military service. So the a passport was not available, even if you sought for it. But the Word of God says, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. To the whole world, the Lord makes passport available to everyone. But who receives the passport? What does the text say? That whosoever believeth in Him. So the passport is available. I, I, I believe that here also United States, as our United States citizens, they can get passport. But don't, they do not give them passport without asking, isn't it? You have to ask, you have to apply for passport, and you receive passport. But now you have to have fitness to travel. And this is what we will study in spiritual sense. Availability, who receives, and our fitness. Uh, and that is about this wonderful righteousness of Christ. For we have no righteousness, my dear brothers and sisters. The Word of God says that our righteousness is what? As filthy rakes. And in filthy rakes we cannot enter heaven. Remember this. Even to come today to church for the, to prepare for the Sabbath, we prepare ourselves. There are many institutions in the world today. For example, if you, I don't know here, but if you go to courts in Australia, you have to be dressed in a suit. You cannot be just dressed in a dirty clothes. You have to be properly attired, as they say. You have to have a proper attire to enter court, courthouse. And even, would you believe, even some hotels, and even some what they call drinking houses, pubs, they call them in Australia. You cannot enter just dressed anyway. You have to have proper attire. So this is, we have filthy rags, brothers and sisters, but we will elaborate on this more. But let's just uh, uh, read 
uh, one more statement, it says, the sweetest melodies that come from God, the sweetest melodies that come from God to human ears, what are they? Of justification by faith and righteousness of Christ. And this affects every human being on this earth. Everyone. We need to be justified and we need to have righteousness of Jesus. Now the word of God says <coughs> what we read in Romans 5.18. Let us read this text again. Romans 5.18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, what came upon all men? The free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So through Jesus came this wonderful free gift. And it is free. Many people cannot comprehend this. That justification is totally free. Now, <clears throat> what is justification? Well, I will just read one statement. It's a full, and when we speak in spiritual sense, when we speak in regard in our relationship with our Savior, with God, with Christ. A definition, it says this way. It is a full, complete pardon of sin. Justification is a full, complete pardon of sin. When our Savior justifies us, or when He pardons our sins, He does not do this only partially. You know, when we uh, offend each other, and I'm sure we all experience this, when we offend each other in some way, and uh, we forgive. But sadly, it is many times what? Not full and complete. There is still some traces of it left, you know. Some reserve left. So in case this brother or sister offends me again, then I will really show to him or to her that I have no more, nothing to do with them anymore. You know, I will remember, I will forgive you, but I will not forget. But the Word of God says, the Spirit of Prophecy tells us here, it's a full, complete, my dear brothers and sisters, pardon of sin. The moment a sinner accepts Christ by faith, that moment he is pardoned. The moment a sinner accepts Christ by faith, that moment he is pardoned. And how? Fully and completely. This is the wonderful truth, the wonderful message, my dear brothers and sisters, with God's people, which Christians have. That this is this uh, a, 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 a joyful hope. It's a, a delightful thought. Something that nobody can take it from all those who have experienced this. I often wondered, you know, when I, I read some many books about early Christians, how they were thrown to the lions, how they were tortured during the dark ages. And I was wondering how, as, as youth, I read this in my young days, and I was wondering how were they able to do this. Some of them even sang. How was Paul and Barnabas, how they were able, and Silas, to sing in, in, in the dungeons? You know, those prisons were not like the prisons today. I know in Australia they call them hotels. No, my brothers and sisters, they were different. They sang. They were on the stake, and the flames started coming up, tortured, being tortured on the rake. And what did they do? They sang. 
as long as the voice could last. Why? Because they experienced this. They experienced the full pardon of sin. They experienced justification by faith. They knew Jesus so well. Now who know who needs justification? Are there some human beings say, well, I don't need justification. I'm so good. No. Well, the word of God is very clear. Romans 3, 23, what does it say? All have sinned. So we are all in the same level, as it were. Same category. All have sinned, my dear brothers and sisters. All. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Just two more texts. Isaiah 56, all we, all. Notice every time it says all. It includes everyone. All like she, we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. So the Lord doesn't exempt anyone. He wants to save everyone. And Isaiah 64, 6 says, But we all are as what? Unclean thing. And all our righteousness, it doesn't say oh, some of our righteousness, can you see? It says all our righteousness. We are all as unclean thing and all our righteousness. And well, plainly speaking, or plain definition of righteousness, it goes much deeper. It says right, right doing. So all our right doings is what? As filthy rags. As filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. So every one of us needs righteousness of Jesus, needs justification, because we all need this full, complete pardon of sin. Because all have sinned. And every one of us needs that, my brothers and sisters. Otherwise, we shall not enter this beautiful heaven which Jesus has promised for us. Now... <clears throat> This is an interesting text in the Word of God, and that is on Gospel of John, which people have asked me many times. Speaking of Jesus, that Jesus is a true light, and in verse 9, Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 9, it says this way, This was the true light. Jesus is a true light, was, is, is true light which lighted how many people? Which lighted every man that comes into the world. Yeah. When it says man, it means every human being. Jesus is a true light. And Jesus lights every human being that comes into the world. And I remember when I was approached first time with a query, Brother, how do you understand this text? Do you believe this? He asked me. And uh, I said, I do. Without thinking much, I said, I do. Well, he said, if you do, do you believe that Hitler was lighted also? That the light of Christ came to Hitler? Or to some of these those who were crucifying Jesus, or those who were during the dark ages putting God's people on the stake. And in the early Christians were thrown to the lions, to Nero's, to all these terrible people. Do you believe that even the light came to them? Yes, I believe, brother. The light came to them. But what did they do with that light? They rejected. This is the John 3:19. And 20, that's right. So they rejected this wonderful light. I will read this text which Brother Barbara suggested. And this is the condemnation that light is come unto the world. And men loved what? Darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were what? Evil. So yes, they rejected the light. So 
This is what the Word of God speaks to us here. But Jesus has offered, He is offering to save everyone, to justify everyone. He is making available to everyone this salvation. Now, and we need to realize this, that without Christ, we cannot have this wonderful justification. Without the grace of Christ, the sinner is in what kind of condition? In a hopeless condition. Nothing can be done for, for him. But through divine grace, supernatural power is imparted to the man and works in mind and heart and character. It is through the impartation of the grace of Christ that sin is discerned in its hateful nature. So we need this wonderful grace of Christ. Simply speaking, we need Jesus. Because we are in a very difficult situation without Christ. Um, we need to realize also that we cannot save ourselves. And young people and every one of us, it is, we need Christ. We need this power, divine power. If man cannot by any of his good works merit salvation, that it must be wholly by grace. Received by man as a sinner because he receives and believes in Jesus. It is a ho holy, a free gift. Justification by faith is placed beyond controversy. And this very interesting statement. And all this controversy, controversy is ended as soon as the matter is settled that the merits of fallen man in his good works can never procure eternal life for him. As soon as we realize that, the matter is settled, isn't it? Now, there are steps in justification. And I just wish to deal with the steps. The just shall live by faith, the word of God says. The just shall live by faith. So we need that wonderful faith. The Apostle Paul wrote that he lives for how? He lives by the faith of Jesus. So we need to have this faith, my brothers and sisters. But how shall we receive faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing of the Word of God. When we hear the Word of God or read the Word of God, the heaven gives us this wonderful faith. Christ gives us this wonderful faith. Faith is the condition upon which God has seen fit to promise pardon to sinners. So we need to believe. But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. So, my dear brothers and sisters, we need to have that faith. That wonderful faith of Jesus. Victorious faith. Now, faith is the condition. Um, not that there is any virtue in faith, whereby salvation is merited, but because faith, what? Can hold can, can lay hold of the merits of Christ. The remedy provided for sin. What is our remedy? Our merits or whose merits? Christ. Merits of Christ. Yes. And faith can, faith can take hold of those merits of Jesus. Faith can, can present Christ's perfect obedience instead of sinner's transgression and defection. When the sinner, when you and I, when the sinner believes that Christ is his personal Savior, then according to his unfailing promises, God pardons his sin and justifies him freely. Oh, what a wonderful truth, my brothers and sisters. You know, our, our, our human uh, limited 
thoughts or even words are so limited to express this wonderful news, isn't it? This wonderful, that's a gospel. This is everlasting gospel, my dear brothers and sisters. This is the message which we must proclaim to the teeming multitudes that are in sorrow and worry. Especially here in the United States, my dear brothers and sisters. People are anxious, they are worried. What's going to happen everywhere, actually, not just here, but in view of what happened last year here. And now the, it's coming soon, the, the year. And people are anxious and worried. But we need to tell them to look to Jesus. Christ is the one who gives comfort. He gives hope. And he gives salvation. It's an unfailing promise. As we believe it and accept Jesus as our personal Savior, then the Holy Spirit works on our hearts. And we have then what? We recognize our condition. When by faith we come to Christ, we recognize our condition. So there has to be recognition. And certainly Apostle Paul recognized this. How did he express his recognition that he's a sinner? What did he say? Yes. First Timothy 1.15 This is a faithful saying and word of all except expectation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Did he stop there? Of whom I am chief. Did we ever feel that way? Surely we could not be chief of sinners because we don't do things which the world does. We don't, well, we don't at least involve ourselves in some terrible things that are in the world. You go to Sabbath, on Sabbath to church. Well, Apostle Paul did all this too. Yet he said, I'm chief of sinners. It's not necessary to do terrible sins to recognize that we are chief of sinners. No. But when we come close to Christ, we accept Jesus as our personal Savior. The closer we come to Him, what happens? The, the more recognition. It's like, you know, I'm staying with Brother Bugis' place. That they, when you go in the bathroom, you switch on the light, there are those very bright lights. You know, you see everything on your face very clearly. Oh, yes, every defect on your face you can see when you have this bright light shining in your face. Oh yes, this wonderful light of Jesus, when you come to Him, then you see yourself as really you have never seen yourself before. This is what Apostle Paul was saying. You really see yourself. You might, you know, in dim light, you might, and you look at the mirror, you sort of think, oh, I look okay, no problem. But in a bright light, when you come, then it's a different story altogether. I remember when I was learning my trade, um, the wife of... Uh, my, my, my teacher or my boss or my employer, she said to me, you know, you know, Brian, I feel, feel like uh, breaking this mirror. I want to throw it on the floor and break it. Because every time I look at that mirror, just, you know, I don't like what I see. <laughs> this is what happens to us sometimes. But when we look to Jesus, my dear brothers and sisters, we, are to, we, we have to come close there. Because Jesus can help us. Mirror cannot help us. But Jesus can. He can change us. This is, so we have to have recognition. That we recognize, admit, and say openly, yes. The first step in reconciliation to God is the conviction of sin. As long as we think that we are good and nothing is wrong with us, we are far from Christ, my dear brothers and sisters. That conviction that we are sinners and that we need that help. Conviction, what happens next as we, con as we realize what kind of people we are? Or as I realize what is my need, what is my condition? Well, we must repent. Because the Holy Spirit shows to us. Now we are convinced, we have conviction, we see ourselves as we are. By the grace of God, we are, we are now repentance is calling. Calling and justification are not one and the same thing. Calling is a drawing of sin to Christ. 
So now we are being drawn. Can you see? The, the Lord works for us in a wonderful way. In a way that we ourselves cannot help ourselves. He draws us. And so in Romans 2, 4, it says, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, because he is now loving us, he's drawing us. We feel his love. We feel the rays of his love and the warmth of his love. And he calls us and he says, we should, we should not despise it, Apostle says here, uh, the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God, what does goodness of God do to us? Leads us to repentance. But this is a genuine repentance, my brothers and sisters. Yes, leads us to repentance. Repentance is thought to be a work of the sinner must do for himself in order that he might come to Christ. They think that sinner must procure for himself a fitness in order to obtain the blessing of God's grace. But while it is true that repentance must precede forgiveness, for it is only the broken and contrite heart that is acceptable to God, yet the sinner cannot bring himself to repentance or prepare himself to come to Christ. Except the sinner repent, he cannot be forgiven. But the question to be decided is to whether repentance is the work of the sinner or the gift of Christ. The very first step to Christ is taken through a drawing of the Spirit of God. As, as man responds to this drawing, what happens? He advances toward Christ in order that he might repent. That's why Jesus says, Come unto me, all, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What a wonderful, comforting thought, full of hope and full of love. So, we just come to Jesus, all of us, my dear brothers and sisters. But I think, I think, well, I have come to Christ, I've responded. But every day that response must come. Because every day the enemy of souls is what? There, to stand in there to tempt us, to draw us away from Christ. So daily. And so as we repent, my dear brothers and sisters, we need to confess our sins to our Lord. Confession must take place. He that covered his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. So acknowledge your heart wanderings to him who knows perfectly how to treat your case. Who knows perfectly how to treat you are in my case, Jesus. Sometimes we know, you know, people ask us for advice to help and counseling. We can do this. When do we do counseling and helping, trying to help people? But we must always point to Christ. Even when we do counsel people, we must not take it all upon ourselves as though we have all the answers. No. Christ is the one who knows how to treat my case. He knows how to treat your case. He knows how to treat the case of every sinner that comes to him. So we must come to Christ. <clears throat> As we confess, then comes forgiveness. And this is the most marvelous experience. The Spirit of Prophecy calls it the sweet joy of forgiveness. The sweet joy of forgiveness. This is something that we need to experience in our lives. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Um, it is the peace that you need, heaven's forgiveness. And peace and love in the soul. Money cannot buy it. Intellect cannot procure it. Wisdom cannot attain to it. You can never hope by your own efforts to secure it. But God offers it to you how? As a free gift. Yes. The sweetest joy comes to, to man through his sincere repentance toward God and for the trans toward God for the transgression of his law and through faith in Christ as the sinner's redeemer and advocate. It is that men might understand the joy of forgiveness, the peace of God, that Christ draws them through the manifestation of his love. 
And my dear brethren and sisters and young people and all the friends, we need to experience the joy of forgiveness. If we have not experienced the joy of forgiveness, our Christian life is a burden. Because we are still struggling by ourselves. But when we come to Christ, oh, this is a wonderful joy and wonderful peace. And this, every Christian, the Lord wants everyone to experience this. Every true turning to the Lord brings abiding joy in the life. What follows now? This is something that... This is our title, my dear brothers and sisters. But the Lord wants us also to be fit for heaven. This is important for us also. Many people stop here and say, I'm... Free, I am forgiven. I have peace, of, uh, peace of, and joy of Christ. I am forgiven. I am justified. But the Lord says to us some, something else. When we experience justification, when we experience this joy of forgiveness, when we go through this process of total surrender to Christ, then in our own experience, we will delight to do what? His will. If we do not delight to the will of God, to do the will of God, if we do not delight, where is the problem? Have we been truly justified? Have we truly repented? Have we truly forsaken? No, brothers and sisters. I delight to do thy will of God, and what? And thy law is within my heart. Now, delighting to, the will of, to do the will of God. What is the will of God for us? Sin. One word. Sanctification. Now, this is very important for us to understand, my dear brothers and sisters. And to teach others. Um, Jesus said, for, And for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also make this, might be sanctified through the truth. This is the will of God. I delight to do thy will, O oh my God, and thy love is within my heart. True sanctification means what? Perfect love. Now that we have peace with God, that we have joy of forgiveness, that we have experienced what it means to have forgiveness <laughs> and to be justified, we have this peace within ourselves. Now we are on a path to, to have this perfect love. Perfect obedience. That's what it says. True church sanctification means perfect love, perfect obedience, perfect conformity to the will of God. Many people want to be just justified, but they do not want to have conformity to the will of God. It doesn't, this is contrary to the word of God. That's what the word of God doesn't speak about. The Lord tells us that we are, when we are justified, then we, we are willing, we delight to do the will of God. We don't have to be constantly reminded, my dear brothers and sisters. And sadly, that often happens. We have to remind again and again and again, no, I want to do the will of God. I love to do the will of God. I delight in the Sabbath day. Sabbath day does not become a burden to me. I remember one brother told me, <clears throat> said, Brother Jackson, I don't know what to do. My 12-year-old son tells me, I hate Sabbath. He hates Sabbath. So sad it is. But this young boy, needs, he needs to be taught about Christ. Then, he, even at that age, he can delight in the Sabbath day. Because it's a perfect love, perfect obedience, perfect conformity to the will of God. Obedience to the law of God is sanctification. Sanctification is not an instantaneous, but a progressive work. As obedience is what? Continuous. So as we have been justified, 
and have peace with God. Now this is continuous, my brothers and sisters. Not that we obey on the Sabbath day. As soon as the Sabbath day is over, what do we do? Then we start disobeying. We think now we are free, we can do what we want. No. We now obey. But we will obey with joy and with delight. We don't have to be reminded now when the Sabbath is over, you should not go there, you should not go there to some worldly places. No. I don't want to do this. Because I delight to do the will of God. See, that this, a Christian life is altogether different. It's a, a life of joy, a life of joy and life of delight to do the will of God. Day by day and hour by hour. There is to be as a process of self-denial and of sanctification going on within ourselves. Not just in our outward godliness. No. But within. Can you see? We are changed, transformed in the image of Christ within. And then the outward works will testify that Jesus is abiding in the heart by faith. So constantly we are to grow, to go unto perfection. Now, and this is also the work of faith, my dear brothers and sisters. Do not think that sanctification or perfect obedience or perfect conformity to the will of God is our own work. It is also work by faith. It is also the work of God in us. The work of transformation from unholiness to holiness is a continuous one. And I pray to the Lord that this will be our experience, yours and mine experience, that every day we continue, not just go forward one step, as people say, and two steps backwards. No, continually. But if we experience justification by faith in Christ, and when Jesus pardons us, He will give us that joy. We will go on continuously. This transformation from holiness to holiness is a continuous one. Day by day, God labors for man's sanctification. Who is working for us? To be sanctified? Our Heavenly Father. Jesus labors day by day for our sanctification. And man is to cooperate with Him. Putting forth persevering efforts. Oh my, yes, my dear brothers and sisters, we have to put persevering efforts as well. Because the enemy of souls is always there to to, to tempt us, to keep us, take us away from Jesus, to lose our experience. So, in the cultivation of right habits, he is to add grace to grace, and as thus he does works on the plane of addition, God works for him on the plane of multiplication. Glory is the, ho is the hope before the believer as he advances by faith toward the heights of Christian perfection. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, this is our goal, isn't it? The height of Christian perfection. That's why Jesus tells us, be, there, be therefore perfect. And heaven has no lower measure than that. We have to come to the statue of Jesus Christ. The Christ is our measurement, you see. And we have to come to that level. Through the exercise of faith, the believer comes into possession of these blessings. Through faith, every deficiency of character might be supplied, every defilement cleansed, every fault corrected, every excellence developed. Through faith. So we go this way, my brothers and sisters. This is our daily walk with Jesus. And you know, when you read about Enoch, how he walked with Jesus... I imagine this is how Enoch walked. He developed this wonderful, every, he was cleansed from every defilement, every fault corrected in him, every excellence was developed. And so he walked with Jesus. And what happened at the end with Enoch? Lord God took him. Yes, he was ready to go. So what will be with us, my brothers and sisters, as we reach this experience? The Lord will what? Come to take us home. He will no longer leave us on this earth full of sorrow and suffering and pain and death. So he is waiting for you and for me, my dear brothers and sisters, to have experience with Jesus, 
So both justification and sanctification is an experience with Christ. When we have reached to that level, to that goal that Jesus himself set up for us, and by his grace, by his divine power, it is possible for everyone of us, everyone. And when we reach to this, the Lord will come for us, my dear brothers and sisters, and he will take us home. Another wonderful statement says that then our daily practice should be the practice of Jesus. So we need to study his life and to copy what the perfect pattern. Probably I have said it here before, but I've mentioned it many places. But I will repeat again now. Those who have heard have to bear with me. You know, in, in, I, uh, by, by trade, by profession, I'm a tailor making suits. When I used to do this work, I had to make many patterns. If we had a new style of, cloth, of, of suit, or jacket, or trousers, whatever we were making, I had to make a pattern. Because I could make patterns for other, tile, for other tilers. Now, I had, sometimes I had to make 30 copies to give to all different people that take a cut. We had 50 cutters in that room. Now, I had to copy patterns. Copy the size. For example, of size 38 or 40 chest, I had to make 40, 40 copies. What do you think I did? I made a copy. What did I do then? Make a copy from the copy. Never do that. <laughs> if you ever involve yourself in tailoring, never do this, my brothers and sisters. Because you will see, if you make 20 copies... The 20th copy you put against the master, what we call master pattern, will be totally different size. It will be different. It will not be 38 size anymore. <laughs> so master cop pattern. And Jesus is our master pattern. We can take good advice and examples of each other, but look to Jesus. He is the master pattern to copy. So in our justification, our sanctification, let us follow Jesus. And He will fulfill His unfailing promise. And when His grace has been fulfilled in us, He shall come to take us home. This wonderful home which He is preparing for us. And in closing, I will just read one more statement. It says here... <coughs> The work that God has begun in human heart in giving his light and knowledge must be continually going forward. So I wish to impress this upon our, our minds, brothers and sisters, and young people, must be continuously going forward this work. Exactly as, as in, in, in nature or in physical life, a child grows. The growth must go what? Continuously. Otherwise, they remind Dwarfs. And we are not to be, we are told that we are not to be spiritual dwarfs. We are to grow to the height of the level of Jesus. This work must go, go continuously forward. Every individual must realize his own necessity. So I must realize my own necessity. And you, we all individually have to realize our necessities. The heart must be emptied of every defilement and cleansed. For the indwelling of the Spirit, it was by the confession and forsaking of sin, that is justification and sanctification, by earnest prayer and consecration of themselves to God, that the early disciples prepared for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Now, now this is for us, now, this one. The same work, only in a greater degree must be done when? Yeah. Now. Not in 10 years' time. Now, it says. The same work, only in a greater degree, must be done now. Then the human agent had only to ask for blessing. Oh, how wonderful it is, my brethren. And wait for the Lord to perfect the work concerning him. 
It is God who began the work and he will finish his work. Making man complete in Christ. How wonderful the truth is, my dear brothers and sisters, the truth of Jesus. How full of hope, how full of joy. All we need is to surrender ourselves to Christ. The strength of a Christian is in surrendering. And then the Lord will do the rest. And we cooperate with Jesus. And then he will come. Because he says, I will come again. And I will take you there where I am. So we know Jesus is there today. And he is coming soon to take us. So I pray to the Lord, every one of us who is in this room. And not only who are here, but throughout the world. God's people will be ready and when Jesus comes, he will take us home. And think, my dear brothers and sisters, of this great reunion day. I love to read when it says that he will send his angels. And he will gather his people from all the parts of the earth. And what shall happen then? And we will be lifted in the clouds of heaven. And so we shall be with the Lord. We shall travel with the Lord. I speak to young people many times when I spoke to them who loves to travel. Oh, how wonderful it will be. And I'm often reminded of, uh, of Enoch. You know, Sister White saw Enoch. Where did she see him? In one of the place planets. And she says, is this your home? What did he say? No, no this is my home. It's not my home. Where was his home? The city. the city is my home, but I am visiting here. <laughs> How wonderful it is. Just think. You know, for us to come to the United States is a big thing. Or for you in the United States to go somewhere else, to another country. But just think to travel the world, to travel the universe. Oh, many wonderful things the Lord has promised for us. But the best is to be free from sin. And to be to be transformed, our characters to be transformed in the character of Jesus. This is something that is available for us all. And we are to experience by the grace of Christ. So my Lord help us, my dear brothers and sisters, that we shall walk with Jesus daily, and when He comes, He will...